out there. This is November 11th, 2016. It's Friday and it's about, uh, oh, about almost uh, 10, 20 in the morning here in Northern California. It's Veterans Day. And uh, I want to talk about a few things today. And I wanted to start by reciting this poem. This was one of my dad's favorite poems. And I, uh, I guess it's one of my favorite poems, and I think a, a lot of people uh, really um, can enjoy this poem. And it's titled, If. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet triumph and disaster. And treat those two impostors just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. Or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop down and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it all on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve you long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run, Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Well, as everybody knows, Donald Trump won the presidency, and I pushed hard to convince people that he was by far and away the better choice. Um, but for whatever reason, it's feeling a little anticlimactic, and I think a lot of people are feeling that same way. And um, I think that the times we're in are still very foreboding and uncertain. 
and uh, people instinctually know that we're in danger. And we, I mean humanity at large, is in danger. And I thought that Hillary's con uh, concession speech was very suspect because I don't believe it's at all like uh, the New World Order cabal and their minions, such as Bill and Hillary Clinton, are really giving up. Um, I think that they're changing tact. You know, they've got a... Um, an alternative plan of action in order to maintain control. And one of those things is stonewalling. Uh, I think that it's so important. Now, I've talked about this a lot in previous videos, but just really wrapping your mind around all the resistance to actually solving problems. You've got to really stop and consider the things I'm saying because it's really true. Um, once the problem, social ills, societal ills, are engraved in stone, etched in stone, so to speak, then it becomes a, a matter of like uh, this disruptive technology in order to solve it. If you solve a problem, you've created other problems. And I know Donald Trump is smart enough to understand that. So he's going into this with his eyes wide open. I think he's being very brave and, and he's courageous. Uh, because he knows that there's a lot of people that despise him, that the notion, the gall, how dare him actually talk about solving societal ills once and for all, you know, ending homelessness, you know, at least abject poverty. I mean, true, we may always have the poor among us, but, I mean, can't we at least, as the greatest nation in the world, you know, end the abject poverty of people dying out on the streets, not only veterans, just, you know, weaker links, People that just don't fit into the system. And it's just unconscionable. It's ungodly that we've let our country go this way. And this is where, you know, Donald Trump and I, at this point in time, are soul brothers. Because, you know, this has been one of my focuses for a long, long time. As far back like I talked about in the last video, and I got emotional talking about the extreme abject poverty I saw in Italy when I was nine years old. And Italy, you know, is an ancient country. So, you know, this shows the lack of, not only lack of progress, but the regression. You know, that's what a wealth disparity is when it gets extreme. This is regressive economic policy. This is greater oppression. And so this is what's happened. This country that's, what, thousands and thousands of years old. And, you know, with the Pope, they got, the, you know, this this religion that's the most powerful and influential on earth. And this is how, this is the example that they're going to set for the rest of humanity, what's going on over in Italy. I mean, this is true. This was 19, say, 1966, 67, in that, in that era, in that range. I don't know what it's like now, but I don't think uh, Italy is known to be a particularly prosperous nation. And, of course, this is the seat of power for the Catholic Church, the Pope resides right there in Vatican City, which is, of course, contained within Italy. But I am disgusted, like uh, Donald Trump, about the abject poverty. And, you know, to solve this problem, I mean, I know. I know he's super smart, and he knows. He knows that this is a very spiritual thing. This is, this is, the, this is the heart of the beast is in maintaining poverty. No, not only maintaining poverty, but to grow poverty. And it is growing. And if you're in another part of the world, another part of the country, you don't understand this. California is just like America sets a trend for the rest of the world, all the nations of the earth. California sets the trend for the nation. So what's happened in California is something that has not yet stopped, even though Donald Trump has been elected president. Um, and I think a lot of uh, very shrewd business people know that something, the worm's going to turn. And, and so many people that, you know, have been just reveling and raising their rents, you know, and, and just, you know, getting the cost of living up because it benefits them. Their numbers go up, even though other people are hurt by it. Um, you know, they know that, you know, things are going to change. They have to change that he's going to push to end homelessness, knowing that there's this huge abundance of extra housing, either for rent or for sale. 
And when I told you in the last video, I mentioned that you could house every homeless man, woman, and child in America and still have 90% of the vacant available housing left over, I forgot to mention that that doesn't even include motels and hotels, okay? So there's a lot more than that that was being quite conservative in the research that I did personally. It's not a difficult thing to do, you know, it's just simple math. But it's just disgusting that we are tolerating this in this country. But, you know, like I said, you know, you solve a problem, and that's the crux of the problem because this really rips the heart out of the beast. If, you, if the beast was forced to end poverty, and we were, you know, it, it was for, through sound money. You see, this has always been my favorite example, like, you know, Rand Paul understands, Ron Paul, Andrew Jackson, Link, uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, JFK, uh, so many other people. Donald Trump, I think he hasn't alluded to it yet, but I think he does understand that sound money is really more a state of mind. It's kind of a demand by we the people. It's just, it's not hard to attain sound money. Um, but you've got to put your foot down. You've got to say, just like a child, you've got to say, no, we're not going in the red. We're going to stay in the black, and we're going to increase the black, okay? That's what's going to happen. We're going to solve the problem. It's, it's the difference between maintaining a problem and solving it. Just like these huge subsidies that are going to go on if we keep on the track we're going with the social welfare system, uh, these these subsidies, the housing subsidies, they go in the pockets of the landlords and they make a lot of these people like Rich Dad, Robert Kiyosaka, whatever his name is, fabulously wealthy. And this happens in per perpetuity. So they need more and more taxes to feed that beast as they raise the rents as the cost of housing goes up. And these poor people can't afford to pay their housing more and more increasingly. That's what's happened here in California. So, uh, you know... Uh, you solve the problem if you just said, look, even though it seems ultra liberal and all this crap to actually buy these poor people houses, let Habitat for Humanity, you know, work it out, you know, let them get busy here. We're going to fund the crap out of them. Let, they've never foreclosed on anybody in their whole history, but they've got all these outstanding loans with all their clients, you know, that they've helped build houses for at reduced rates, by the way, far reduced, probably about a third of what you would pay market, what they call the market rate, you know, which is a bunch of bull, value versus worth. Is it worth it? No, of course not. But, you know, value is, it? no, of course it's not, you know, it's just, it's a, a stupid thing. People don't understand there is a difference. I mean, how valuable is a roof over your head? Well, it's like your survival. How valuable is your survival? So it's not up for dollars and cents debate, okay? That's the point about value and worth, you know. So it's worth a lot, yeah. But value, I mean, no, it's a poor value. You're paying exorbitant rents and mortgages here in California, and it's going to sweep across the country as they steal more people's houses. They tempt people with refinancing your house and all this, but nobody's economically secure. You don't know. People live hand in mouth, paycheck to paycheck, you know, one paycheck away from homelessness, you know, half the country. I mean, the, the statistics are stagger, staggering. So, I mean, as wildly liberal as that might sound, to just buy people houses that can't afford them, it would be fiscally prudent, you understand? So, at least there's light at the end of the tunnel, just like somebody, the difference between buying a house and renting a house. You can see eventually it's going to be paid off, okay? And so the, your taxes are going to go down. They've got to go down because there's no more subsidy needed. But understand this. So who are you going to hurt? You're going to hurt the status quo. This is the whole disruptive technology thing by extension and bringing it into what I'm trying to, trying to convey to people and help people to understand here is that if you did end poverty and nobody was living in fear, abject fear of, of homelessness, okay, when, when the statistics show, you can look them up, it's readily available, how many people die annually in America out on the streets, you know, through, through the exposure and different things to the weather. Uh, you know, their immune system gets broken down and they get some disease that takes their life. They get murdered. I mean, they had a rash of murders in San Jose just down the road here in the Silicon Valley there. And ten, at least some 10 homeless people are killed. So I hope all these people have, are, you know, packing heat and they've got big dogs to protect them at night because there's, there's some psychopathic SOBs out there that are working for Satan, okay? I mean, how can you? I mean, you're going to live with that? You're going to stand in front of your creator someday and answer for murdering some homeless person, okay? 
just because you you know you, you, there are there are blight in your neighborhood or something. I mean, think of who caused these problems. These are caused. Poverty is not incidental. Poverty is caused because people don't allow us to have sound money. Sound money would create a gradually rising tide of prosperity. And I've explained over and over, but I'll explain again how that works.